I'd like to welcome you to this edition of the PRS Journal Club podcast with your hosts, Dr. Sammy Sino, Amanda Silva, and Raj Shah Martinez. Enjoy. Welcome, everyone, to the February 2016 PRS Journal Club podcast. I'm Amanda Silva, and I'm joined by my fellow PRS resident ambassadors, Sammy Sino and Raj Shah Martinez. Today, we welcome our guest discussant, Dr. Paul Sederna, Chief of Plastic Surgery at University of Michigan. We'll be discussing our February Twitter Journal Club pick. It's lipofilling of the breast. Does it increase the risk of recurrence of breast cancer? A matched controlled study by Kronowitz et al. out at MD Anderson. So many plastic surgeons perform fat grafting for breast reconstruction following oncologic breast surgery. However, the oncologic safety of this procedure has not been adequately studied. The aim of this study was to determine whether fat grafting for breast reconstruction increases the rate of local, regional, or distant recurrence or primary breast breast cancer in risk reduction surgery. Three groups were investigated. The case group consisted of women treated with either segmental or total mastectomy for breast cancer and then later underwent fat grafting for part of their reconstruction. The control group consisted of matched women who underwent segmental or total mastectomy for breast cancer whose reconstructions did not include fat grafting and then the cancer-free group, which consisted of women who underwent segmental or total mastectomy for risk reduction or benign disease, and then later underwent fat grafting. There were some differences between the groups. The cases were significantly more likely to be earlier stage compared to the controls. They were also more likely to receive hormone therapy and a greater volume of fat grafting. The controls were significantly more likely to have HER2 new positive cancers and were more likely to receive chemotherapy. Uh, The mean follow-up time was roughly 60 months. And multivariate analysis showed that there was no significant difference in local, regional, or systemic recurrence between the groups. There were also no cases of cancer in the cancer-free group reconstructed with fat grafting. And additionally, there was no significant difference in the predicted five-year local regional recurrence rate between the cases and controls, which was 1.6% and 4.1% respectively. Further subgroup analysis did show a difference in local regional recurrence in patients treated with hormone therapy, 1.4% in cases versus 0.5% in the controls, for which there was no good explanation why. So ultimately, this paper concluded that there's no increase in local regional recurrence or systemic recurrence with fat grafting, and their data supports the oncologic safety of fat grafting and breast reconstruction. Uh, So now I'd like to turn this over to discussion. Dr. Sederna, I'd just be curious, you know, what your thoughts are on fat grafting and breast reconstruction and what the practice is at University of Michigan. Yeah, thank you very much. It's a very nice summary of the paper and a discussion of the issues around it. I've got to tell you that this is an incredibly important study, um, mm-hmm. important as it relates to breast reconstruction, but important as it relates to the use of fat grafting both in the breast and actually just about any other location. You know, when we're thinking about fat grafting and considering local recurrence uh, or systemic recurrence of breast cancer, uh, we really have to think about what impact that fat grafting is having on those tissues. I mean, it's obviously a common approach we use to optimize reconstruction. Um, It's a primary approach for reconstruction in some cases, like when we use Brava. And it's incredibly important and powerful tool to provide women with the highest quality reconstruction possible. But we really do have to know if it's, if it's safe. And as we are in this era where the FDA is considering whether we should actually be using fat grafting at all in the breast, when they're considering whether fat grafting is homologous use in the breast, which means that we use fat in the breast for the purposes of breast, um, or if it isn't homologous tissue there and we shouldn't do it, or when they're considering minimal manipulation of tissues, whether the tissue has been modified or not. Um, These types of studies are so important because they address the safety of this approach, which is the primary concern of the FDA and the primary thing we need to address to ensure that we can preserve this important, powerful tool to help our patients get good outcomes. So this is a very, very important paper for us, I think. Um, but as we as we think about it, though, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about. They've included a large number of cases, but it's a it's quite a mix of cases. So, if you could talk a little bit about the differences in those types of cases and how that may impact what we're seeing in outcomes. Yeah, definitely. So they they do. They have a wide variety of cases. They have women who underwent total mastectomy, and then they also have women who underwent partial mastectomies or 
lumpectomies. About 10% of the group underwent that. Um, and then they also have uh, patients who are various stages of cancer. Uh, they include DCIS, which actually uh, alludes back to one of the previous studies that's included in our collection for the month uh, for an article to read as well to uh, enrich discussion when you read this article by Pettit which uh, was a retrospective review and looked at patients uh, with breast cancer who underwent fat grafting for reconstruction and actually showed an increased risk of breast cancer recur recurrence with DCIS. Um, so th that's interesting that they, they don't find those results and many other studies since that study have not found the similar results to Pettit. Um, I'd be curious, Dr. Stern, are you familiar, are you, um, if you have any thoughts on that study, that original study and anything, uh, any sort of reasons why they would have come to those conclusions versus uh, many studies afterwards haven't really found those same results? Yeah, I think it's um, frequently uh, when we look at a lot of these studies and we do subgroup analysis and things, we end up with type 2 statistical errors. We're just underpowered. And when mm -hmm. the studies are underpowered, we end up with conclusions that may not be appropriately drawn based upon the statistical power of the study. Um, it isn't unusual that the large breast reconstruction outcome studies that are done prospectively are thousands and thousands of patients, you know, mm -hmm. 3,000 patients or more. Um, and, um, and even in those cases when they do subgroup analysis, when they just look at people who had segmental resections and radiation. Now you can look at that group, but the number starts getting small and now it's pretty hard to even do a reasonable analysis just of that group. So we take mastectomies and we take segmental defects and we have some with chemo, some without chemo, unilateral, bilateral, non-invasive versus invasive. It becomes very difficult and I think that's where we struggled with some of those previous studies. Mm -hmm. Now, um, well, how about... The I'm sorry, how about the time period? Because the cases that were included here were from 1981 to 2014. Right. So what are your thoughts about that time period? Well, a lot has changed in breast cancer therapy during that time as well. Yeah. And, and so also, this... we, we weren't really fat grafting back then either. It's the other thing, fat grafting is a relatively recent thing that people have started doing for breast reconstruction. Yeah, you're, I think you're exactly right. I mean, clearly the techniques of fat grafting are different. Clearly, our screening techniques are different. Technology is different in how we screen. Our mm -hmm. screening recommendations have changed. Our fat grafting techniques have changed. Mm -hmm. So that muddies the waters a little bit also. Mm -hmm. I, I think if I, if I, if I, I mean, but I think there, the fat grafting started in 2001 for that specific group, but their controls are back uh, uh, into the 80s um, in there. So, and I totally agree because that's going to create all the bias related to the time mm -hmm. differential. One of the things that, um, I think there's two things that I think, uh, this is a very exciting paper for me, so I, I apologize for jumping in, but, um, you know, one thing that uh, as I was reading uh, as a huge proponent of, of fat grafting and seeing the great effect it can have on our patients, um, was in this study where they noted in their, in their subgroup analysis the increased uh, rate of recurrence with hormonal therapy, that 1.4% versus 0.5%. So I thought that was an interesting um, sort of caveat here to the whole study, and I, I was really appreciative that the author sort of towards the end uh, made, it, made a, you know, an important discussion point about that, saying that real, really we need to study that more and that it really shouldn't stop fat grafting in that subject. Mm -hmm. Because that was my first thought, is this going to be a, uh, a reason to not fat graft in that patient population? But the numbers are still so low, um, yeah. even for those who recurred. I mean, 1.4% is very low and seemingly lower than the rate in control groups. So it's interesting there. I think there may end up being something physiologic potentially um, mm -hmm. with the hormonal exchanges, but I, that's obviously conjecture. Um, and, and even if there is, it seems like that effect would be fairly low. Uh, do you have any insights, guys, or Dr. Siderna on um, Yeah, I'd be curious what Dr. Siderna thinks, because in the paper, they, they essentially say there's not a lot of research on this. So it kind of opens a whole new door for, you know, granted, like you said, these are really low numbers, so who knows if this is even real. But it does open a whole new door to, well, why would this possibly be a case and for people to think about different areas to research the effect of, fat grafting on cancer recurrence and how the hormone, how hormones play into that. Um, but yeah, I'd be curious, Dr. Sederna, if you have any thoughts on why that yeah. might be. 
Yeah, I think, um, once again, I, this is an incredibly important paper, and um, and even though there are a number of issues about what, you know, what techniques were used along the way and the time mm-hmm. period over which the study was done and things, these studies are still really valuable because they do give you glimpses into some of the issues that may be important. And then it gives you the opportunity with that data to design a really high-quality prospective trial around that piece to look at it in more detail. But without this paper, you don't even know what those questions really are. So, you know, maybe now there's not a difference, but then maybe you want to delve a little bit deeper and you want to see, well, maybe if we're doing stromal vascular fraction or just straight-up autogenous fat grafting or ASC-based augmentation, mm-hmm. maybe those are all a little bit different. I don't know. Well, to go on with that point, I think in terms of, you know, clinical study, this is obviously really well done, but I recently heard Dr. Longacre express a little bit of, of curiosity and interest uh, and sort of a challenge to the future as to what can we uncover in terms of the effect of the ASCs when you're bringing these stem cells into the breast uh, parenchyma, what actually does that affect long-term in terms of uh, proto-oncogenes. I, I just am curious, do you ultimately think, number one, is the f- definitive answer to this question lie in in basic science? Or do you think if we really delve clinically, we can uh, sort of rest some of the uh, of skeptics to rest? Or is it a combination of both? And number two, if you had a relative that had finished their breast reconstruction and needed 50 cc's of fat on each breast to make a perfect result, would you recommend that relative to undergo fat grafting knowing what we know today? Yeah, so those are, those are all great questions. And I will tell you, we have spent, uh, we have a regenerative medicine task force that's been working very diligently over the past year to respond to the FDA's concern around fat grafting. And we are responding to it very aggressively because we as the ASPS and PSF believe that this is such a powerful tool and so important for plastic surgeons to be able to use that we want to ensure that the FDA understands what we're doing and and understands the implications of what we're doing uh, with all of us having the same goal in mind. We all want to provide good, safe care for our patients. We don't want to harm anybody, and we want to provide them with the optimal outcome. So we as the ASPS, I think, need to be the leaders in this. And, and I do believe, as you've, as you've stated, that it's a multi-prong approach. It will be clinical studies. It will be basic science studies. It will be um, a number of different approaches and a number of different forms to really answer these questions. Uh, but as of today with what we know, I would be perfectly comfortable with any family member of mine or loved one of mine to have fat grafting in their breast following a lumpectomy or in radiation therapy. I, I believe that the concerns are relatively low, um, and uh, I certainly wouldn't hesitate to recommend that to them. Right. One of the, the I, have one, you... I have one quick question. We probably need to wrap up our discussion, but I do have one <laughs> quick question for you, Dr. Siderna. Um, yes. Through reading about this, some people have mentioned timing, that, you, that maybe there's a risk of fat grafting within a certain time window after the oncologic resection. Some people mentioned two years. Do you think there's any, uh, any weight to that, or what are your thoughts? So um, um, clearly the um, the environment into which cells get placed will alter the mm-hmm. behavior of those cells, no question mm-hmm. about it. So whether those cells are going into a radiated field or whether those cells are going into a scarred bed or whether those cells are going into a recently operated field, it will change. And those cells will have local paracrine effects on the cells around them, which may be differently based upon the biologic milieu in which they live and the mechanical forces on them and all the other things that change cellular phenotype and cellular secretion. So so there's no question in my mind that there are probably differences at different times, but 
how are those significant, I really don't know. But mm-hmm. but there's certainly those cells will respond to that environment into which they're placed, and the environment will respond to the cells that have been placed there. Mm-hmm. Any so a very long-winded <laughs> a very long-winded tangential answer to a pretty direct question. But <laughs> we have a lot to learn. No. No, that, yeah, that was wonderful, and, and I, I, I was—I I apologize for continuing. I'm so excited about this paper. I have tons more questions, but I think Amanda is right. We probably should wrap up. And we so continue on our plug. Twitter Journal Club. Exactly. Yes, yeah. Uh, I'm using the hashtag uh, PRS Journal Club. We may actually have Dr. Uh, Kronitz himself, the lead author, and his co-authors okay. joining us on the Twitter discussion. Look out for the date. Um, and thank you so much, for Dr. Soderna, for joining us yes, and leading our discussion here today. Uh, Amanda and Sammy, last thoughts? I think that was a great discussion. Uh, we really appreciate Dr. Soderna's time and, and wisdom and uh, look forward to the March discussion. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Okay. Soderna. Yeah, thanks, guys. Well done. Great session. Appreciate it. Mm-hmm.